thank you so much for being here and for staying this long. Uh, two economists, one American and one British, are uh, discussing the reasons that they support a large government intervention to restrict uh, immigration. Uh, two big reasons, wages and institutions. The American economist says, it is obvious that immigrant competition must reduce wages. His British counterpart, I entirely agree with you that it must diminish their wages. Nothing can be more fallacious than the attempts to make out that there is any compensation to those whose labor is displaced. But not just that, there's a second reason they support this intervention, and it's institutions. Maybe a, a bigger question of, of uh, the effect of immigration on the uh, culture and institutions that underpin the entire economy. The American writes, such an admixture of peoples would be to the degradation of the superior civilization without any commensurate improvement of the lower. And his British interlocutor responds, only a temporary good is done to the migrants while a permanent harm is done to a more civilized and improved portion of mankind. Now these are uh, arguments that might be very familiar to you because they're, they're, uh, they're around all the time. I want to point out a few things about this conversation. The, the first is that it's happening in 1869 uh, between uh, the biggest of the big shot economists. Uh, the American is Henry George, the British is John Stuart Mill, and they were arguably uh, the leading economists in each of their countries uh, at the time. Uh, the second, oh, and, the, and the policy intervention they're discussing, uh, is a total and complete shutdown of immigration by ethnically Chinese people to the United States. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is that uh, neither of them offers any evidence for these assertions that they're making uh, uh, very uh, confidently about the effects of, uh, of migration or the effects of restriction. The, the third is that they got what they wanted. Uh, Thirteen years later, there was in fact a total and complete shutdown of uh, immigration to the United States by ethnically Chinese people from any nation, and it lasted 70 years. Uh, and the fourth thing is that there wasn't any evidence then, uh, nor is there any evidence now, that that policy achieved the goals that these uh, very smart people uh, confidently claimed for it. There's no evidence that Chinese exclusion raised American wages. There's no evidence that the uh, uh, proper functioning of the US uh, economic institutions depended upon Chinese exclusion. Now, uh, these conversations have uh, continued. It's 147 years later. Uh, many of you were here this morning to hear about the latest research on wages from, uh, from a few of its uh, top proponents. So I won't talk about that. Um, but what I find remarkable is that although the, the wage conversation came back in the 1980s and continues uh, in the economics literature, this second conversation about the uh, bigger effects of immigration on the entire economy through the, through the channel of, uh, of economic and uh, other institutions uh, only came back uh, pretty recently. And we were just talking at the coffee about what, what fraction of, of, of research in immigration economics is, is on uh, its effect on relative prices like wages and, and how much is, uh, is on these uh, larger, well, let's say broader questions of, about the wealth of nations. And it, it's something like 98.2 or 99.1. There's very little about uh, the effect of migration on the wealth of nations, with some notable exceptions. So uh, a few years ago, I wrote a paper called Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk, uh, trying to explicitly to nudge economists to look more at this, uh, this other and more neglected uh, question of the, the effect of migration on, uh, on the broader wealth of nations. And it, it's, a, it's a very simple paper. It, it, uh, it just says, look, now that we have pretty good evidence that the productivity of a worker depends critically on location. That is, the economic productivity of exactly the same worker, even performing exactly the same task, can vary by an order of magnitude depending on what country they're in. That has a, a remarkable implication, which is that natural and policy barriers to labor mo mobility between countries could be enormously costly. Uh, for example, there are estimates that uh, uh, barriers to the movement of just 5% of the current population of developing countries to developed countries uh, cost the world economy trillions of dollars a year, more collectively than all remaining barriers to trade and all remaining barriers to international capital flows. Very large uh, uh, effects. 
uh, there has been a response to these uh, uh, claims in the literature, and it's what Lance Pritchett of Harvard and I call the new economic case for migration restrictions. And it focuses on these uh, exact same uh, uh, arguments in the second point that uh, George and Mill were talking about in 1869. Uh, it's, uh, it's been the subject of discussion by another British and another American economist uh, uh, many, many generations later. Uh, so the idea is that people from poor countries, when they migrate, don't just experience higher productivity themselves, they reduce the productivity in general of the people around them in the place that they arrive by spreading bad productivity to those people. And for that reason, uh, I'm not making this up, in the literature it's called the epidemiological model. Uh, Raquel Fernandez of, of NYU has an authoritative handbook chapter on this subject and that's what she calls it. And the, the, the analogy is, is, uh, is to disease. Uh, so here uh, is a British economist, Paul Collier, in a book three years ago, making this case. Uh, I don't want to, uh, I want you to know that I'm not mischaracterizing it, so I'll just read it if you don't mind my reading it. Migrants are essentially escaping from countries with dysfunctional social models. The cultures or norms and narratives of poor societies, along with their institutions and organizations, stand suspected of being the primary cause of their poverty. Uncomfortable as it may be, migrants bring their, cult their culture with them, with the potential risk that the social model of the migrant destination countries will become blended in such a way that damagingly dilutes its functionality. So an American economist, uh, George Borjas, reviewing this book in the Journal of Economic Literature last year, uh, puts together a little model of how the epidemiological model might bring about uh, the result of canceling the gains to, the, 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 the simple economic gains to migration. And he parameterizes uh, with lambda the fraction of low country total factor, of poor country low total factor productivity that comes along with migrants. If lambda were equal to 0.75, Borjas writes, that is 75% uh, of the uh, uh, bad total factor productivity from poor countries comes along with migrants embodied in them, the net gains to global labor mobility become negative because now the entire world's workforce is largely operating under the inefficient organizations and institutions that were previously isolated in the south but have now spilled over to the north. Uh, he concludes the article with this uh, diamond of rhetoric. Beware of social engineers who promise the existence of trillion dollar bills on a mythical sidewalk at the end of the rainbow. Those promises are often based on flimsy modeling and inadequate evidence. Now, I'm, I'm not sure uh, which researcher he's referring to. Uh, it, uh, it, it sounds like quite a, a, a deluded and, and naive uh, person who must cut uh, quite a pathetic uh, figure. But what makes this statement even more remarkable is, is that he, he doesn't offer any actual evidence of this effect, much like uh, Henry uh, George and, uh, and John Stuart Mill generations ago. Uh, it, it's a conjecture that the effect uh, might happen. And stepping back from maybe unfortunate rhetoric like this, uh, we can't rule this out. And it, and it is plausible that at some, there must be some uh, very large stock of migrants from poor countries or uh, very large flows of migrants from poor countries that would be associated with a change of, of institutions. That's, not, uh, that's certainly not implausible or impossible. The question is, where, where, would, that, uh, where would that rate uh, lie exactly? And uh, um, it, it's, it's remarkable to see a, a, an evidence-free discussion of that in 1869, and then an evidence-free discussion continuing 146 years later, as if nothing from which we could learn anything had happened uh, in between. So what, what Lan Pritchett and I do in our paper is say, well, uh, what's, the, what's the simplest way we could start uh, to look at the evidence on this question? There is quite a variance across countries in the stock of poor country migrants there, that is migrants born in countries with low total factor productivity. Um, is there an association between that stock and lower levels or lower growth of total factor productivity? That's simple to do in the Penn World tables. And, uh, what you see here on the horizontal axis is the fraction of a country's population that is made up of migrants uh, from countries with less than three quarters of US total factor productivity. Uh, uh, poor countries with low total factor productivity. 
and on, on the vertical axis is growth of total factor productivity over a 20-year period. There is no relationship here. Now, uh, th this is just, a, if you were here this morning, this is just a, a kind of an international version of what Giovanni Peri showed you about the relationship between areas in the United States with very large uh, uh, stocks or, uh, or uh, growth in, in uh, the number of international migrants and uh, the productivity of labor in those areas. We don't see any evidence uh, uh, in, in variance across the stocks that we, that we observe. Uh, uh, of a relationship between those stocks and uh, lower levels or lower growth of total factor productivity. However, it is, uh, again, not inconceivable that somewhere way out to the right of this graph uh, in regions we don't observe at very high levels of migration, very high stocks of migrants from poor countries, there would be such an effect. So what Lane Pritchard and I do in the paper is put together a little model of the things that would determine uh, that effect and, and uh, 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 use uh, data on migration that we know about right now to calibrate that model and ask what would be dynamically efficient migration? That is, what would be the rate of migration uh, uh, that would be so high that it would just offset the uh, pure economic gains from uh, spatial reallocation of labor? Um, so I won't go through the model. It's incredibly intuitive. Uh, it depends on, on three things that uh, are, are not difficult to imagine. The first we call transmission or tau. This is the fraction of uh, low total factor productivity that is transmitted to my countries of migrant destination along with migrants. The second, assimilation. And here we're just talking about assimilation in terms of productivity, is the rate at which that transmitted uh, low total factor productivity dissipates once you arrive in the country of destination. Uh, and what we parameterize as uh, congestion is, is simply nonlinearities in these, uh, in, in transmission and assimilation. That is, it could be that at very high stocks or flows of migration, the uh, transmission is higher and assimilation uh, is lower. Now, uh, before just uh, talking about a couple of results and concluding, I, I want to talk a little bit more about what we should expect about these parameters, what they, what they mean. So uh, before thinking about the plausibility of very high transmission of total factor productivity, you would want to do something that Collier and Borjas don't, which is uh, 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 seriously dig into the development and growth literature for what economists know about what total factor productivity is. And uh, Lance and I, you could do it various ways, but Lance and I classify uh, those explanations for total factor productivity, the, the differences between the wealth of nations, uh, uh, aside from, from uh, factor stocks uh, in five strands. That, that is, total factor productivity, you could imagine it as knowledge. Uh, how exactly uh, do you build a 747? Uh, you could envision it as uh, capabilities. That is, uh, what are the local clusters of goods and services that must be available in, in order to enact any specific set of knowledge? For example, I could give you the plans for a 747 and all the instructions for how to make it, but if you went to Niger, you couldn't make it there because of a lack of complementary, uh, 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 of, uh, of the ability to produce complementary goods and services for that production. And that's a, a literature that's associated with Ricardo Hausmann, Cesar Hidalgo, and others. Uh, a third strand uh, posits that total factor productivity is, uh, is management somehow, or the allocation of assets and uh, uh, productive capacity within firms, across firms, and across sectors. And this is associated with CA and Klinau and others. A fourth is that total factor productivity in, 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 uh, embodies differences in uh, institutions, uh, for example, the, uh, the ability to protect property rights. And a fifth uh, discusses total factor productivity as differences in uh, culture, for example, norms of uh, interpersonal trust. Now, there isn't time to get into detail about these, but I do want to point out that uh, it's very clear that several of these are not plausibly transmissible with migrants. No matter how many uh, migrants from Niger came to the United States, that would not plausibly decrease knowledge in the United States about how to make a 747. And it would not plausibly decrease the, the capabilities of uh, industrial clusters in the United States to provide the goods and services that are complementary to making a 747. Um, I, I would say the same for, uh, for uh, management techniques. Uh, institutions and culture, at least in, in principle, are uh, transmissible internationally. But it, here's where I want to talk about assimilation. If we're talking about institutions, 
in, an institution is a, an emergent phenomenon uh, in a group of people. It is not something that can be embodied in a human. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the way that we put it in the paper is that an institution is not something a, an individual can have in the way that an individual has blonde hair or has the flu uh, or has a university degree. Um, the clearest way to see it is, is the institution of uh, what side of the road you drive on. Now, even if you are a native left-hand driver, and that's what you've been doing all your life, uh, the day you come to the United States, it's in your interest to drive on the right-hand side. Uh, if you don't uh, immediately uh, adapt, it doesn't matter to what extent the institution is embodied in you because you'll be dead. Uh, an institution is the, is the set of expectations and the set of expectations about people's expectations ad infinitum that exists within a group of people. And it, it's not something that is uh, simply and automatically transmissible by an individual uh, who arrives. Um, finally, congestion. Uh, th this is something we just don't know much uh, about. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is certainly correct to say uh, uh, economists know very little about the consequences of very, very high levels of immigration and very high immigration stocks, but there's not no information at all. Uh, uh, you have Singapore with 40% uh, foreign-born, Vancouver, Canada with 40% foreign-born, Toronto, Canada with about half the population foreign-born, and those are not places that uh, are experience low levels or growth of total factor productivity. Um, it is nevertheless possible that uh, other places could be different or that at much higher levels and stocks of migration, things could be different. So uh, here's what we do in the paper uh, with the, just the few minutes that I have left. Um, put, put together a, a very simple uh, one sector, two factor Cobb Douglas model and, uh, and ask, uh, uh, for a given rate of, of transmission of, uh, of, uh, of total factor productivity from uh, low TFP countries to high TFP countries, for a given rate of assimilation, for a given rate of uh, congestion, where congestion is a, a certain bending of the, of the, uh, of the transmission curve, uh, do a few pages of integrals and see if you can come up with a simple expression for what the, the rate of migration would be that, again, just, uh, just offsets the simple uh, 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 global gain from spatially reallocating labor. That's the expression for it. Uh, it's it very intuitively, uh, it, it's, uh, it depends positively on assimilation. You could, you could have more mig migration at, at higher rates of assimilation of productivity. It depends negatively on transmission tau. The more of uh, poor country TFP comes with migrants, uh, the lower the uh, dynamically uh, efficient rate would be. And it depends uh, negatively on, on congestion. That is, the more non-linearities of things get, get uh, worse and worse as you have higher migrant stocks, uh, the lower the dynamically efficient mi migration rate would be. And we, we gather the evidence we have on the parameters of this model. So just to give you a flavor for how we do it, um, for migrants in the US, there are nine very low TFP countries that have large enough samples of foreign-born in the census data to uh, to establish a relationship between uh, the earnings of those people when they first arrive and compare it to, to, uh, to uh, how the, those earnings evolve over time. This is what Ghanaians look like, Ghana-born people in the US Census, where the, the, the horizontal axis here is the years since immigration, and the uh, horizontal line is the, the uh, earnings of a US native uh, with the same uh, simple observable characteristics of age and education level and uh, gender. Uh, and the black line with the 95% confidence interval around it is the earnings of a Ghana-born person. So what, what we do is, is just give everything to the, the epidemiological model and say uh, the, the hit in earnings that you're seeing not long after or at, at arrival and, uh, and for, for years after arrival is entirely uh, due to bringing low productivity with you. And uh, this dissipates at the rate that you see there. We, we estimate a half-life of that effect uh, uh, for people from Ghana. Here's what it looks like for Mexico, a lower hit up front, but also slower assimilation, both of which you would expect uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, knowing the differences between Ghana and Mexico. Uh, that's the flavor of where we're getting parameters for, for transmission and assimilation. For congestion, uh, are there non-linearities at very high levels of, uh, of immigration? This is a graph that's similar to, thank you, 
This is a graph that's similar to the one Giovanni Peri showed this morning uh, when the, uh, I, I believe it was uh, uh, immigrant uh, uh, changes in the stock of, of, uh, of uh, immigrants across uh, cities of the United States uh, on the x-axis was what he showed, and uh, changes in earnings on the y-axis, you saw a positive uh, relationship there. This is just the, the, a similar graph in levels across uh, census areas. So these are uh, public use micro data areas, or PUMAs, of the US Census, 2,000 uh, uh, odd uh, divisions of the United States. The x-axis is fraction foreign-born, so you can see there are a few of them with very, very high immigration uh, immigrant stocks, 60, 70, 80 percent of the population uh, immigrant. And the, and the y-axis is simply uh, uh, earnings of uh, average workers in those places. And uh, you do see, uh, with a, a simple uh, moving average there, that there is a little bit of a curve down at very high levels of immigration. And we don't try to explain that. It could be because there are other uh, uh, characteristics of the workers there, for example, that they have lower education. But we, we just uh, uh, give everything again to the epidemiological model and say, let's, let's set the congestion parameter below that, uh, that curve that you see across uh, areas of the United States. That is, assume a congestion parameter of 0.5. That blue line is what the relationship would look like if congestion were 0.5. That is, a, a, uh, uh, things get worse at a faster rate than you, than you see across areas of the United States. Put those together, uh, and you get this graph, which will take a minute to explain. Uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis is uh, what you might assume about uh, an assimilation rate. On the vertical axis is what you might assume about the transmission rate. And those blue lines are uh, the, the relationships between assimilation and transmission that you would expect for a given level of, uh, of uh, dynamically efficient migration. All of this at, uh, you can see in the upper right hand corner, assuming that congestion, the congestion parameter is 0.5. Why do they, those blue lines slope up? Very intuitively, because if there's more transmission of bad stuff uh, from poor countries, you would need there to be faster and faster assimilation for a given uh, level of migration to be dynamically optimal. And the, the, that m equals 0 line is, is dynamically optimal zero migration. The, the dotted line next to it is the immigration we have right now, which is 0.3% uh, of the population per year. The line next to it is 1% of the population per year, then 3% of the population per year, and then unimaginably high rates of 5% of the population uh, per year. And the dots you see on here are the data for, uh, for transmission and assimilation for the nine very low TFP, uh, for people from the, very uh, from the nine very low TFP countries that you saw in the census data. And you can see that uh, all nine of them are to the right of the 1% the line, and seven of them are to the right of the 3% line. That means that uh, uh, this, uh, if this, uh, this uh, epidemiological effect were to bite and actually be capable of erasing the uh, the uh, economic gains to migration, it would happen at a level of migration that is uh, over an order of magnitude over the levels that, that we, uh, higher than the levels that we see right now. That doesn't mean that we recommend in any sense these levels of migration. Our, our question is just a descriptive one of if this is a real effect, give everything to it and ask when would it, uh, when would we expect it to occur? We would expect it to occur at levels of migration so high that, current, that, that they're just uh, irrelevant to, uh, to discussions of, uh, of current uh, policy. Now, um, here's, uh, here, this discussion is very old. Here's a cartoon from 1903 that I like a lot. Uh, those, the, those guys on the left-hand side have bandanas that say ruffian and anarchist uh, on them. And uh, Uncle Sam is experiencing a danger to, uh, to American ideas and institutions. Uh, clearly, the new economic case uh, uh, for migration restriction is, uh, is not new. Uh, we also argued that it's not a case either. The, 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 the case has not been made, and the, the case awaits uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 data or, uh, or, or reasoning or evidence that could be brought uh, uh, to support it. There are economists right now uh, promising that uh, migration restrictions will uh, bring tremendous benefits, such as protecting the institutions on which our prosperity depends. But to, to quote an influential economist, beware of social engineers. Uh, their promises are often based on uh, flimsy modeling and inadequate evidence. Thank you.